You're listening to Emmy Award winning host Jordan J. Adams. Real interesting show for you today. What if I told you that everything you're currently doing for your dental health really might not make a difference? Worse yet, what if I told you the things you're doing might even be speeding up your dental decline? And what if I told you the American Dental Association's theory of tooth decay could be flawed? Well, that's the hypothesis of today's guest, Rami El Nagel. And this is a fascinating guy. I can't wait for you to meet. Well, thank you for being with us, Rami El. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us uh, first a little bit about yourself and your background and why you became a dental health advocate? Well, I my young daughter, when she was little over the age of one, started, had a little white spot on her tooth, and then the white spot became a brown spot, and then that tooth kind of crumbled apart, and uh, we were feeding her a natural, organic diet with no sugar and no white flour, so we thought she'd be in good health, and we contacted the local dentist to see what they could do about her tooth decay situation, and the treatment options they had were not very good. And uh, as a result, I went to search for another way. I don't have any educational background in the field of health. I studied uh, yoga and uh, hands-on energy healing, uh, cranial sacral therapy. Um, But when I started researching health, I found that this was something I was good at, and I didn't understand why people didn't make the connections between the historical research and what's happening in modern time. So my, my talent is in, is in the researching and understanding. And I believe that her problem could be cured. And I saw that there was flaws in the current explanations about tooth cavities. So I just went to find another way. And then uh, eventually once I did, I wrote a book to try to share with more people so that they don't get stuck into the dark hole that we got stuck in. And you had tremendous results with, with your daughter. At some point, her first set of teeth were so soft and so in such bad shape that they were almost turning to powder in her mouth. I think one. I think you said on one of, on one of your shows that um, one of her tooth literally dissolved, but the new teeth that came in under the new protocol, which we'll visit in a little bit, um, but I want to examine the problem first. The new teeth that came in came in strong, vital, healthy, um, and just beautiful teeth. Yeah, her new teeth don't have decay. Her her baby teeth had uh, lots of cavities. Some of them, you know, where the tooth was worn to the gum line. And uh, we were able to treat it nutritionally. I think that's the big thing is that it didn't require drilling and fillings and, and chemicals or or metals to be put in her mouth to to protect her body from tooth decay and to heal it up. So, so the main thing is that you don't have to get all this drilling. And the dental surgery is not a dental cure. It's a, it's a crutch. Big difference. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the American Dental Association official position on tooth decay. Um, their stand is that it occurs when foods containing carbohydrates, sugars, starches, bread, cereals, milk, soda, Cake, candy, you know, the usual, uh, the usual villains. Bacteria that live in the mouth digest these foods, turning them into acids. The bacteria, acid, food debris, and saliva combine to form plaque, which clings to the teeth. The acids in the plaque dissolve the enamel surface of the teeth, creating holes in the teeth called cavities or caries that actually, frankly, that makes sense to me. I, that's what I've heard my whole life, and it, it seems to be pretty intuitive. What's the problem? <laughs> Uh, well, how many times have you gone to the dentist and had new cavities, even though you kept your mouth clean? Right, right. Yeah. And I am, I am religious about keeping my teeth clean. I am, you know, I'm a big flosser and do all kinds of protocol and I'm still having issues with my teeth. So there's, there's, uh, and not only that, don't you exercise and eat well too? I sure do. So if you're, you're doing all the things they say you're supposed to be doing and yet you still have problems or that, and you, if you go to the dentist, most dentists might go, oh, you're not, you're not doing it right. You're doing something wrong. Even if they look and they see your mouth, they can tell if your mouth is totally clean or not. And 
and you're not. You're doing. You're following the rules. You're trying to be responsible. So something's not right. Either either there's something inherently wrong with what you're doing, which maybe the field of dentistry would say, or there's something inherently wrong with their belief system about what the the problem is. Now there's a good reason to tell people that uh, it's it's the mouth environment that causes cavities, and that is because there isn't much you can do to stop it. And also, if you just change your mouth environment without changing your diet and nutrition, what's going to happen is you're going to keep coming to the dentist with more and more problems. Because if you look at the population in general, the older people get, the more cavities and dental problems they have. Regardless of how much brushing and flossing and fluoride that they're taking, the problems still get worse. That's what the data, the survey data shows. So if, if the dentist or the field of dentistry knows the problem is going to keep getting worse and they don't help you make it better, then they have a, a, a continual supply of things to do and, and more ways to make money. Yeah, and that's what this is. This is an examination. I, I know that there's a lot of people out there who might, when they initially hear you say, well, you know, I don't necessarily have a quote unquote health background that a lot of people would look for. They look for some sheepskin. Um, this is an examination of what works and what doesn't work. And this is based on, for me, self-experimentation. And for a lot of people who the protocol offered just never worked, that the traditional allopathic protocols have not worked. So it's, it's really a desperation, and I need to find out what the truths are and to figure out, is sort of look behind the, um, look behind the curtain, if you will, and see what's really going on. One of the other indicators... Um, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, you're going to give the information and people can try it out themselves and see if, if they get uh, a good results. Here's the and well, one. one thing about so I have a degree in legal studies from, from UC Santa Cruz. That's my actual degree, but all the information in my book it, uh, is based on the work of dentists. So there's dentists who have spent their whole life studying the problem of tooth decay, figuring, figuring out the nutritional and biochemical causes of it reporting this information to the American Dental Association, even having it published in dental journals, and yet this information hasn't been taken seriously and respectfully as it needed to be. So a lot of my work is to bring back this forgotten information and make it really clear and easy to use and take out all the complicated uh, dental academic terminology. And uh, that's why I get good results is because other dentists, I'm my book is built on the lifetime work of other dentists that's a beautiful thing about what you're doing um is, and the beautiful thing of the internet frankly that you can get this information out to so many people because we don't have to reinvent the wheel there have been as you said people who have dedicated their entire lives to figuring out this exact problem we're talking about there are cultures who do not have dental disease and so when when you look at you look at the United States, by the time you're 39 years old, close to 90% of the population in the United States will have tooth decay. Clearly, what we're doing is not working. So I don't care how many uh, sheepskins are on the wall. What you're doing is not working. I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed with your results. There are cultures that have zero close to zero dental disease. Wouldn't it just be easier to model them? Why is that so hard to do? <laughs> There's no easy answer, that, Ramiel. That, that. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, this goes down. This goes down the road. I'll say it for you because this is, this is this this is where I get mad. I think there's big money in drill and fill, and these guys. They're, they have big hearts. They're good people. They're, there's no boogeyman. Everybody goes home to their kids. Everyone's trying to do the best they can. And everyone feels like they're doing the right thing. But they close their minds off to alternatives, especially if it threatens the status quo. And that's, that's really what's going on here. It's no different than a lot of the other subjects we talk about on the show. Well, I think there is a small portion of dentists who are good or genuine and who do help people. But uh, the majority of them, uh, I, I would say it is the boogeyman. There is, a, there is a collusion of silence and a collusion of ignorance because the, the dentist sees the results of his actions. They, can, they see that there's cavities coming back or see that the problem's recurring or notice that when women get pregnant, they always get cavities or notice that it's always the growing kids who have these problems. 
they they can almost just look at people and know what's what the problem is. Uh, so so the fact that there isn't more thoughtfulness in the uh, about what's going on, um, th there is something wrong with that. And even many dentists who know better, they keep their mouth quiet. Uh, I, I knew a dentist. I heard of a dentist in Canada, and he didn't do anything alternative. He, but every, most patients who came in with a small cavity, he would say, I think your cavity can heal. And that's it. So let's, we're just going to wait. And he didn't do anything else. That was his treatment. He just waited. And a large, a large percent of his patients, the cavities actually healed on their own. And that's because cavities are seasonal. And I found references to this in the old dental literature. So your tooth hurts. You go into the dentist. You're actually having a seasonal temporary problem not always but but many times and the the training of the dentist is to, to use this problem as an opportunity to make money and also in some ways they're even legally required if they if you go to the dentist and your tooth hurts a little bit and he sees a little hole he's obligated to tell you that he needs to fill it or maybe or if he doesn't maybe his license would be suspended for not treating you properly incentivizing just the wrong things. Um, well, let's, let's visit the problem itself because um, most of the people who are listening to this are already going to have had issues and they're already going to not be thrilled with uh, allopathic solutions uh, or attempts at solutions, and that's why they're searching. So they're going to be looking for answers. You, your website, first of all, and usually I do this at the end of the show, but let's do this right now so people can surf it while we're talking. Your website is jam-packed with information um, in every category that you can possibly imagine for, for dental and oral health. Can you give us a, a, that address and um, so people can be taking a look at it while we're doing the show? CureToothDecay.com CureToothDecay.com Yeah. Check it out in there. There's so much cool information. I don't even know where to start. But one of the things that, it, it, that one of the things that was really cool was the was the story of raisins because shortly there's going to be a big fuss about hey everybody raisins are actually good for your teeth. They're really good for you, which is exciting. You know that's going to excite everybody because it's a sweet food. Every who doesn't like raisins? And they're saying that the raisins, the bacteria. They're going to it's going to feed the good bacteria on the teeth and that it's actually going to help keep in check the bad bacteria on the teeth. So go crazy with the raisins. You're, in fact, saying that that it's neither a positive nor a negative. Raisins are neither positive nor negative because it's they're on the wrong track altogether. It's not a bacterial issue. It's a blood sugar issue. Am I correct in this? Uh, yeah. And that's based on the work of Dennis Melvin Page primarily. He's really the one of the first dentists who brought this to bear. And what he found is that when we eat foods that are sweet, we know that it affects our blood sugar. That's everyone, you know, there's the glycemic index. So when we eat sweet foods, our blood sugar starts to fluctuate. And the sweeter the food, the more intense the sweetener, the less natural it is, the more it causes an imbalance in body chemistry. And as that body chemistry gets pulled into an imbalanced state, the body then seeks to create balance. And it does this by withdrawing minerals, particularly calcium, from the bones or other, or other organs. So if you can frequently eat sweets over time, you're frequently going to be causing your mineral levels to become out of balance, which over time is going to cause your glands and other uh, systems in your body to malfunction. It's causing minerals to be pulled out of your system, and eventually your teeth suffer from the process of demineralization, and then you get a tooth pain or sensitivity. During the process of demineralization, there could be bacteria involved. They're actually probably helping your body to get the minerals that it needs, and, and they're a sign that, that your body is out of balance. Certain bacteria are, but they're not the cause. It's not what the bacteria are eating is what you are eating that makes the difference and you ask well why is it like this we have to go back to to uh, uh we have a culture and a belief system 
that doesn't want to be responsible necessarily for uh, their problem. Uh, so we go to the dentist with uh, the assumption that they have the responsibility for our dental health. And, and we've given our power to authorities too much that, that shouldn't have that power, nor should the dentist be put in that position to be that responsible. Um, the dentist and the, doc, the, the doctor and the patient, need, they need to be meeting each other halfway. But people, the general culture, probably not your listeners, wants just a drug or a pill to take their problem away without really changing uh, their, their belief system. So, th so this whole idea of, of germs as the cause of cavities or other diseases is based on the fact that in general, there's a lack of willingness to be responsible. So the first thing I talk about in my book is that uh, if you want to change, you have to be willing to be responsible for your actions and, and, and what you're eating primarily. You know, you just uh, touched upon something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is um, it's not your fault, folks. It's not your fault. That is a, that's one of the uh, food industry scams. Uh, in the whole thing of get more active, yeah, we do need to get more active, but that's not, that is not the issue, Mrs. Obama. The issue is you're allowing, you're allowing the big agribusiness food conglomerates to manipulate salts, fats, and sugars to create addiction. Deep, 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 deep addiction. The same addictive neuro pathways in the brain as cocaine and heroin. Brutal to get off, and I'm in that fight right now. I'm still in that fight. I get trying to get off that processed flour and sugar and the silly stuff that's in 90%. Well, uh, let me say something about that. I don't have an exact remedy, but I want this is from the work of Melvin Page. He found that the reason why, so a lot of your listeners probably have a, a some type of food addiction, or they wouldn't even call it a food addiction, but maybe it's chocolate or coffee or uh, cigarettes or alcohol. That's uh, white flour also. Sh sugar and white flour, those are all addictive substances. What happens is our chemistry is out of balance. The levels of minerals in our blood, particular calcium and phosphorus, are out of balance. And what happens is we don't feel good. When you t eat one of these substances like chocolate or white flour, white sugar, caffeine, cigarettes, when you use one of these substances, it temporarily brings your body into balance again. It pulls the minerals out that you're missing from your deeper levels, and you feel okay for a little bit. But then you go deeper into the imbalance, because these are imbalancing foods. They're not building foods. So his, his remedy was um, pituitary gland uh, concentrate, uh, powdered pituitary, or, or was injected. And I'm working on getting that out. There's, there's one place to buy it, but the quality is not very good. I'm working on getting a better pituitary. Uh, just to sell to people. But that helps balance the glandular system. But there's other ways to get your system in balance. But the point is when your system is, is out of balance, that's what those addictions are from. And, it, it, and the people who are, who are considered alcoholics or have more strong addictive tendencies, it's just that their system is so sensitive. When, when their minerals get out of balance, they become desperate for this uh, substance because they actually need it to become in balance. So we got to look at the changing the foundations to get your system into more balance so then it doesn't need that uh, addictive substance anymore. But it's really, it, it's almost like the person with the addiction, it's, it's hard not to do it or to will yourself not to do it because because there's a chemical imbalance that's happening. You, boy, you, you hit it on the head, Ramiel. You hit it on the head. I'll go paleo clean all day and I'll get all the benefits of a nice clean paleo. I'll get clear headed. Uh, my stomach gets nice and flat. I start feeling fantastic. And by day two, it's like the gremlins come and uh, they're like, you will eat sugar and you will eat it now. And it's not even, I, it's not mental, dude. It is. I get stupid. I can't think straight. My hands get shaky. Um, I know I need to do a detox. And I know, I know intuitively now that everything. And I, I just use the word paleo loosely because uh, I don't believe you can be, you, you should be overly strict in that regard either. I think there's plenty of things outside of the paleolithic period that we should we should be consuming. But just in general, what we're talking about here, um, that is the way to go because it is about balance and it is about minerals and nutrients and hydration. And, but but crushing that, beating the addiction is the, is the first step because. It's so important that you and I reiterate that it's not 
a failure on the person's part to do it. You're getting closer and closer each time. You, you try a different protocol and you get closer and closer. You have that much more knowledge and you'll finally, you will finally get there. Uh, well, I'm working on it, but it, it's again, it's it, the, the addiction is caused by a lack of absorbable minerals. So it's important to be clear. This is the same thing that causes tooth decay, primarily a lack of absorbable calcium. And so I have a little formula that based on the work of Weston Price for how you get the absorbable calcium in. And of course, there's many complexities because the more you do to get your system in balance, the more likely you'll get the results that you want. So, uh, so to get calcium, I, I recommend calcium from food, particularly dairy products. Now, I know some paleo people don't do dairy, but many people uh, do really well with a goat or sheep yogurt. There, uh, some, some yogurts are even allowed on specific carbohydrate diet because all the milk sugar has been pre-digested by the bacteria. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't cause sensitivity in most people. It has, it's full of probiotics and the pre-digested calcium is highly, highly absorbable. So, so I recommend for people who can do dairy to, to do raw dairy and if you if you're not good with cow products, most people can do goat or sheep products. And you can even, even the store ones are okay. It's better to get stuff from the farm because I want to support small farmers and usually the food's more nutrient dense. And then you need fat soluble vitamin D. So there's two things. So uh, the vitamin D uh, helps our body metabolize the calcium. And most of our population is highly, highly deficient in the vitamin D because our requirements are very low. And, and but by studying indigenous cultures, De Dennis Weston Price found that uh, the, the difference between the people immune to cavities and those who have cavities are that they're missing the fat soluble vitamins, particularly vitamin D. So the best way to get vitamin D is with a supplement of fermented cod liver oil because it has its the vitamin D in its naturally occurring form, not the synthetic vitamin D. There's over 900 forms, at least 900 forms of vitamin D. And when you get naturally occurring vitamin D, you know you're going to get many of those forms. When it's synthetic, you're only getting one or two or three of those specific forms of vitamin D. So it's not as effective. And, and there's potentials over the long term for toxicities to happen. So when you take vitamin D, just, just to give you an example, very practical. Uh, there was a survey study done by, I believe it was the University of Washington, by a dental professor. Just adding vitamin D to the diet, on average, will reduce someone's rate of cavities by 47%. Why every DDS isn't telling you that when you leave their office, I'll never know. I mean, isn't that the first thing? Isn't prevention, isn't do no harm... Uh, Aren't those the, isn't that the first line of defense? Uh, I mean, that, that information should be screaming, be screamed from the rooftops. I, I can't understand what, why there'd be any pushback there. Well, you kind of initially, yeah, on one hand, it's like, why isn't it in the front page? And actually vitamin D has been in the news and they are going to raise the minimum amount or there's this uh, idea to raise it or it was raised. I can't remember the recommended amount. It's still very low. Uh, a dentist is a DDS is doctor of dental surgery. See, de dentistry as we know it today kind of goes back to the Civil War era. Imagine you're just a regular person, farmer. Most people were probably farmers back then in the 1800s, and you don't do much to your teeth. But then one day you got a horrible toothache, and maybe there's a massive hole. The tooth is rotten. I mean, this tooth is beyond help. You go to the dentist, who they used to be barbers, and he fixes this problem for you, probably with mercury, and now your tooth doesn't hurt. So the origin of dentistry wasn't bad. It was to help people get out of pain. And the surgical procedures help people, in certain instances, get out of pain. But it went from this uh, preventative, or not preventative, this sort of after the last resort surgery to save someone's health, the do no harm me mentality to 
finding every possible excuse to perform a surgical operation on the person's tooth. So when we made that that gap of turning it to um, from a procedure that's needed in emergencies to procedures that we should just do all the time for almost no reason at all, that's when we we got this um, over drilling and filling. And as a part of this growth of the dental industry, at some point they, they colluded. There was a collusion to decide to focus on this. Uh, what's called materialistic and and um, isolated form of, of treatment. Before World War II, and I have books to prove this, I have a book from the American Dental Association for, published just before World War II of all these different opinions on why tooth decay happens and how to treat it. And very rarely did anyone say there was bacteria. And very rarely, and, and many dentists at that time were not, necessarily keen on just doing operations. Yeah, it's uh, you brought to mind the story of these guys um, who were eating the right food and had just just stuff caked on the tooth. And, you know, they were not brushers. They were not flossers. And when they finally did go see a dentist after 10 or 15 years, the dentist would scrape everything off the tooth. But the tooth was fine. The gums were fine. They had great tooth health and great gum health they just had a lot of stuff stuck on the tooth but that really bears out the what you're talking about in that it's what you're ingesting so it's not actually the substance on the tooth per se because these guys had stuff caked on their teeth but the teeth were fine it, it there was no degradation to the tooth because it was an inside job if you will exactly and wd miller who wrote microorganisms in the mouth who uh, he was sort of let's say an inventor or bringer forward of modern field of dentistry, and this is in the late 1800s, said that, that um, weak teeth easily succumb to acid. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But teeth that are strong resist acid and bacteria indefinitely. So the guy who invented the theory that bacteria cause cavities also knew and wrote in his book that there's that teeth become immune to cavities when they're uh, uh, bacteria when they're strong. So if you have if you have a good constitution or good minerals in your system and you're absorbing your food, your teeth and gum are going to be healthy. And it doesn't matter what's on the tooth, carbohydrates, plaque, bacteria, whatever. Uh, it's not going to dissolve the tooth away. But as soon as your body becomes weak, then it becomes susceptible to to the uh, more susceptible to the oral forces and. More recently, 100 years later, uh, some dentists from the University Loma Linda Dental School discovered that there's a mechanism in our body that, that tells our tooth to remineralize or demineralize, and it's called the dentinal fluid transport mechanism. So our body is actually controlling whether it decays or not. And again, if you go to the dentist and the dentist says, you know, your body's in charge of this, it doesn't have much to do with bacteria. Then, then the question the patient might ask is, well, what's the point of drilling my teeth then? If you're just joining us, we are talking with Ramiel Nagel, who is a prolific researcher. I'm going to call him the Sherlock Holmes of oral and dental health. He has written books. He has a wonderful uh, website. What's that website again? CureToothDecay.com. And he is giving us, he's given us this very generous download of information on how we can not only uh, slow down, stop, or halt tooth decay, but perhaps even remineralize your teeth, which is really exciting information in regardless of how you feel about it. If you've got a skeptic uh, nerve that's that's uh, twitched by Ramiel and what he's saying, good, good. We all should be good critics. We should be skeptical. Go study this stuff and start learning about it and start researching. Again, Ramiel's not saying, hey, listen to me. Ramiel is saying, listen to all of these dentists who've come before and made these discoveries and made their information known to the powers that be. They're published dentists, very prestigious, uh, well-respected dentists, and their information was largely ignored. So, Again, it's not Ramiel saying this. It is Ramiel just transferring information from Dennis and giving us some of the uh, 
wonderful biohacks. If ever there's a biohack, <laughs> it's learning how to remineralize a tooth. <laughs> yeah, and making it simple too, because a lot of the de- they used to discuss this and argue it. It was it was a, it used to be okay to conflict with people and the scientific uh, method and debates and all that stuff. They used to do that all the time, and uh, it just it just got it just stopped it, it got suppressed and hidden and, and thrown away and and at the detriment to all of our health so uh but yeah i, I have made it simple and translated it because a lot of uh many dentists or health researchers they got lost in different aspects of because they try to isolate certain things they just you can get lost in the research and and i try to keep it really simple and practical yeah, and and there's a lot of practicality on the website. Uh, let's let's go through some of these protocols because that's uh, the real takeaway here. Um, we already talked about the fermented cod liver oil. Um, you have a, a a hot link on your website to a company called Green Pastures Royal Blend Fermented Cod Liver Oil. I will be getting some. Um, I have a farm here in Tampa, Florida, where I live, where I get all of my goat. I get raw goat milk. And I ferment it myself. Um, I make my own kefir. I'm really big on ferments because they helped to save my life. So I'm a huge ferment guy. And um, so obviously, you know, the goat uh, milk raw and fermenting it is just a wonderful protocol. Uh, You also talk about bone soup. Now, this is my edge, brother. Uh, (laughs) This is something I've never tried. And uh, but it's something I am absolutely interested in doing is uh, first the first thing I, I'm sure it's for the readily absorbable minerals. Are there any fat issues in we still are having this battle about too much animal saturated fat? And there's a lot well, of who's pres- having the battle. Well, <laughs> I know there's there's a lot of science on both sides, though. You know, I, I respect Esselstyn. I respect um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who was in. Um, Fat, sick, and nearly dead. Uh, you know, he was the doctor for the for the Aussie guy. Um, oh God, Fer- Furman, Joel Furman. Um, I respect a lot of the veggie guys and and the um, vegan guys because you know they came before us and and it's a it's a strong well, the protocol. Veggie and, and vegan guys aren't against fat; they're just against uh, animal fat. Animal fat, right? That's they don't my think exact you eat lots point. Of coconut oil and Correct. olive oil. Avocados. That's my you're exact. You're gonna starve point. if you if you're not eating you're all not, that. I know, and that's my exact point. And nuts too. Lots of nuts. How much fat? I mean, that the issue is, and I'm excited to talk about phytic acid in a second, but with the nuts, but with the saturated fat issue, the big distinction that those guys would draw is the animal saturated fat is where you do get the collection of fat along the arterial walls. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to deviate too much from the dental side of things, but then again, the heart is so closely related now to dental health. It is, you know, we are talking about the same thing. Yeah. The, the plaque in the arteries is, is not related to saturated fat. And I think that was proven from Japanese studies because the, the, uh, but the, the point is the plaque, the plaque in the arteries is like the plaque in our teeth. And the the re, the cause of the plaque is is improperly metabolized food. It, it's not it's fat or uh, this or that. It's whatever you can't metabolize correctly. Now the more in the more processed the food is, the farther away we're getting from our hunter gatherer digestive system, which we still have. Uh, the the closer we get to the uh, malabsorption and maldigestion, which is going to cause the plaque. And, the, the, and particularly, I believe it's the, the highly processed vegetable oils that, that causes the plaque in the buildup and also the high fructose corn syrup. Uh, and uh, so, and all the veggie and vegan guys would agree to not uh, eat the, the corn and the soybean, the canola oil, all those oils that are industri- industrially processed aren't correctly recognized or metabolized by the body. Every cell in our body or most cells is surrounded by it, it's it's water encased in fat, and when you eat these fats that uh, haven't been in the human diet except for the last hundred years, in in a form the body can't recognize, it makes our system toxic, and and malfunction. 
there is a question about how much, it, it's also a question of how much fat should somebody eat? Because a lot of people might say, oh, a little bit is okay. A little bit of butter, a little bit of salmon, a little bit of red meat. And each person is different. So there's, people have different types of metabolisms. The third thing is, if somebody's really overweight or obese, uh, and they want to cleanse and detox, it might be good for them not to eat much fat, uh, temporarily, and they might get a lot healthier. All I'm pointing out is, if you want to heal your cavities, you got to have animal fat. That's the lesson of Western Price and all the traditional cultures. They've, the animal fats were sacred, not just for, for, health, for being healthy, but also for reproduction and good growth and development. So children need to have animal fats too. And pregnant women and, and before conception, they need to have these animal fats. Um, there's, there's no way around it, particularly the vitamin D. The vitamin D that heals cavities is only in a few types of animal foods. It's in animal blood, it's in fish livers, and it's in some certain types of insects. And if you're not eating those foods, you're likely to have uh, tooth cavities. You know, it's interesting what you said about there. There's some corroboration for what you just said. I, I just finished up an interview with Dr. Peter Langshan, who is the world's foremost expert on coenzyme Q10. Um, guys, prestige, prestigious. Uh, if you want to go check out his credentials, just the last name is Langshan. Just put in Langshan or coenzyme Q. And, um, you know, he's the guy everybody goes to. And he said the same thing you just said there. You're only finding it in certain places. It's in the liver. It's in the heart. It's in um, animal organs. And, and coenzyme Q10, the blood plasma levels of coenzyme Q10, is a, there's a 100% aspect ratio to health and longevity. It's the, you know, it's the, uh, and I, I won't do it justice, but that's where the energy is. That's where the, so, you know, you literally just said the same exact thing he said. What happens for me? I'm just the, the average lay guy. Uh, what I am, I'm a, I'm a sports commentator. I have nothing to do with health. But when you find 17 or 18 different unrelated sources, all saying the same thing, all without an agenda, and all with science behind them, and then they all start corroborating, that's when I start sitting up and taking notice and saying, you know what, maybe... Maybe the powers that be, and again, it's it's not malicious. It's it becomes, it becomes bureaucratic, and it becomes just like you said. It becomes an ignorance, and it just becomes uh, collusion due to laziness. Uh, and so, you know, for this information to be out there, and for there to be such such uh, a backing, and so much independent corroboration, it drives me nuts. That my I I had to go learn this stuff, and my dentist will not tell me this, and um, you know that I have to watch for my kids. Like you have to. That's the other takeaway. If it's to be, it's up to me, guys. You have to go out and figure this stuff out, and and make your own discoveries. Well, that's kind of the biggest um, crime or deceit or whatever by the dental industry is that when you go to the dentist and he reports that you have tooth decay or gum disease that they do not inform you that it's because your body's not strong, that your body's out of balance. And because the dentists are the first people who see these chronic degenerative problems. And when they don't tell people that these chronic degenerative problems can be fixed by correct nutrition, then, and just you drill and fill and the person gets worse and worse, um, they're, they're doing a great disservice because people are getting more chronic diseases later on the road that, that's much harder to treat when it was first seen by the dentist who saw a little hole or a little inflammation. And then that later became arthritis or cancer or whatever, uh, all kinds of problems. I'm curious about the coenzyme Q10 doctor. So he recommended people eat organ meat? Yes, he did. He sure Which did. ones were his suggestions? Yeah, his big one is the heart. That's heart. the, the okay. highest concentration of coenzyme Q10. It's in the heart. So... Based on the work of Melvin Page, I'm actually going to be selling uh, freeze-dried grass-fed glandulars soon because glandulars uh, and organ meats are so essential to our health and so helpful to our energy level and to getting our metabolism back into balance that everyone's got to have it. Uh, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard for people to get all the organs and, and even liver, which is the most easily 
sourced organ, and I recommend from grass fed or free ranging organic animals. Definitely uh, organic, right? Because the liver is a concentrator; it's a filter, right? So yeah, you, yeah, heavy metal city. If you don't get organic, yeah, it's 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 going to have a lot of gunk in it. Yeah, um, I recommend people eat liver regularly. It's hard to give an amount, but but because it's so important, I'm even offering a supplement. I always recommend that people get the the fresh if they can but I'm putting together a multi-mineral supplement that's going to have 14 organs and glands and it's going to, I, I call it essential because our, our hunter gatherer primitive uh, bodies were designed uh, to eat these organs because when, when our ancestors killed the animal, they didn't eat the steak. Like the Eskimos, they feed a lot of the muscle meats to the dogs and go for the organs when they kill an animal. They eat the fat too. Yeah, the animals, if you look at wild animals out on the prairie, you know, what's the first thing they eat when they kill another animal? They go right to the organ meat. They don't, they're not eating any, they're not eating anything else. That's the first thing they eat. Then they'll eat some other stuff if they run out of organs. Yeah, and Weston Price, he visited a tribe in Africa that, that can, who didn't have any cavities, and they considered the liver sacred. And one thing they had noted is the king of the jungle, the lions and the tigers, when they kill an animal, they usually go right for the liver for the first thing. Interesting. Interesting. You know, and I, I, I just want to say this too, because I, there's a, there's a part of me that feels a little badly. I, you know, I lived in LA a long time. I was in the vegan community and I love those guys and they helped to, to get me well when I was, you know, I went from the standard American diet to vegetarianism, then to vegan, um, and now have morphed to some a sort of a paleo combo it seems to me that the the big key here is you know when we're saying organ meats i can see a lot of people saying just too too much animal fat too much dangerous triglycerides too much i think and tell me if i'm if i'm on to something here i think that those things only become dangerous when the blood sugar is raised then they can become dangerous fats is that fair to say uh, I don't know if the fats are ever dangerous. I don't even know what the fat content, I had to double check. I don't know if liver or heart or even has that much fat or more fat than a, a regular piece. That Good point. It's going to have as much fat as a steak or something like that. But it, it Maybe it has less. Yeah. It, it may have less. Some organs may have less. Um, look, people got to get out of their heads. And, and this is, it's very, the, one of the most primal foods is, is organ meats bone marrow you know imagine a hundred of thousand years ago humans hunting and seeing a carcass and you can they can break open the bones and eat the marrow and, and go for the brain that if the real paleo is the organ <laughs> meets the fat and the brain oh yeah that now you're now you're going heavy duty now you're going paleo old school old school paleo, <laughs> old school paleo. And, and 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 ironically the brain which has a pituitary gland is the key to is one of the keys to help getting our body back, back in balance Wow. Because when we eat the standard American diet and expose ourselves to the chemicals and the heavy metals and the drugs and the vaccines and, and EMFs and all the all the stuff, toxic water, fluoride, all this stuff we get exposed to, stressful lifestyle, air 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 pollution. Uh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Well, I know I know what you're meaning. You 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 need a protection. You need to have your immune system really running at full potential. And I wanted to circle back to, you know, the vegan vegetarian thing and just to speak to people who might still be in the vegetarian community who are listening to this and might be curious. I did a, um, a vegan blood panel, uh, and it came out excellent. Uh, my doctor was said, you know, I had the blood of a 27 year old. You're doing great. I'm in my mid fifties. He said, you're doing fantastic. These numbers are awesome. I can't even see you improving on them. So that felt me, made me feel great, obviously. And then I did a paleo blood panel with him a year later. I was doing, I was doing biohacking and doing the self experimentation, and and my blood panel on the paleo, he was blown away. He said, "I did not think you could improve upon the numbers that you had last year, and you've improved on every single number in every blood lipid panel." Um, and so that. You know, that's all I'm looking to do. I don't have a dog in the fight politically. I'm looking to stay alive and I'm looking to keep my arteries clear. I want to be clear headed. 
I had kids late in life. I'm in my mid fifties. I have two little kids. I want to be around for their graduations. So I'm looking for the truth. You know, like John Lennon said, just give me some truth. And that, you know, that's what I'm looking for. And so you have to self experiment. We're not asking you that we're not, we're not even trying to get you to do anything. This is just an informational podcast. Do it for yourself, experiment for yourself and see what works. It might not work for you. Like Ramiel said, everyone's metabolism is different. Everybody has, you know, people have different types of blood, so it might work better for other people. It might not work well. well the for the theory people. works. It's just the amounts that you can take. So some people need more protein. Some people need less protein. Some people need more fat and some people need less fat, but we all need vitamin D. We all need some mo modest amounts of animal fat. It doesn't need to be a lot or not. Well, there's a very, very, very small percentage of people who might do okay with, without animal fat. And sometimes people need to cleanse and they're toxic and they need to avoid fat and protein and let their body reset. But as a, as a building lifestyle, it's not sustainable. That's uh, that, interesting. Uh, if I could jump right in there, because I'm going to be doing a detox um, pretty soon. I'm going to be going down to Hippocrates, my good friend, Brian Clement down there, going to do a, uh, a, a wonderful fast and a, and a detox down in West Palm Beach. And, but I didn't know, I don't know much about detoxing. I didn't know you had to get off protein and oil. Um, how long do you, I mean, obviously during a fast, you get off everything, but when I'm doing a, a juice fast is, am I supposed to get off of every, everything? And for how long should I do that? Do you, are you familiar with the detox space? Oh uh, yeah. I've, I've tried all kinds of, <laughs> um, what, what is work for me, and I, I'm like a really bad case because uh, orthodontic work really damaged my, my body and my ability for metabolism to work. Because people don't know there's a connection between our, our heads and our, our bite and our digestive system. So, but what, what really works, and Max Gerson used to cure people of cancer, and he would do, this is a lot of the vegan stuff comes from think, people like Max Gerson because he would do, um, you know, you get juice every hour and uh, veggie juice, fresh pressed. And uh, they probably do something like that at Hippocrates because they're, they're on a vegan system. And it, and it helps people. And it, it's, it's uh, wonderful. But you also give them liver juice from fresh liver. And the glandulars just, for me, they work magic. And for juice, I, I drink vegetable juice regularly. And I, I promote vegetable juice. But I can't live off of it. And when I cleanse, I get too hungry, right? so I don't fast on it. But having some organ meats or the juice of liver or the juice of liver and pancreas raw, not cooked, is absolutely profoundly medicinal to the body. So if at, if at those juicing places they added a little bit of raw, raw organ juice, it would probably work a lot better because our, uh, our body needs the, the yang energy. The veggie juicing is all yin. Yeah, Gerson is is one of the most prestigious guys out there, um, and he's just like Ann Wigmore, you know, back in the day, flipping people and the the, the people who were all beat up by uh, you know um, chemo and drugs and big pharma and botched operations. And again, some of it has a place, but it's used ninety percent too much. You know, these people who were just battered and the doctor said go home and get your affairs in order you have two three months to live a lot of them go into wigmore and you know a lot of them uh, go into gerson and flipping them and flipping them around and and saving their lives and why that isn't being screamed from the rooftops i don't know because it's just plain is it's this i'm not talking about theory i'm not talking about hearsay they do it all the time they save people through these juicing protocols and um, i'm really curious about this glandular adjunct to juicing it sounds when you when you said when you said profoundly medicinal i mean that's a powerful i want to know more about that the glandulars is is that where can, where can we find out more about that or where can we get these types of supplements to do in conjunction with a juice fast well i'm uh, i'm launching a website to make these available to people cheaper and, and more accessible uh i don't have the glandulars on there yet it'll be available by July or August 2014. And that website is traditionalfoods.org. Um, if you go online, you can find some liver glandular. I wouldn't recommend other sources. Uh, I don't have a, a referral for other places to get glandulars. And the fresh is always uh, much more potent. 
than the freeze dried, but the freeze dried still works really well. It's much better than none. It's sort of like the gateway. Because once you start eating the freeze dried heart or liver or whatever, it's so much easier to eat the fresh. And also you realize how much your body really needs it and feels good having it. Um, but the whole uh, uh, William Donald Kelly cancer carrying protocol is based on the, uh, the pancreas, pancreas enzymes, which are from animal pancreas. And even all the, the detoxing in the veggie juice, primarily, I think the raw vegetables, all the enzymes help feed the pancreas because our, our, our digestion is out of whack. And that's why we get toxic. And Ayurvedic medicine knew this more than 2,000 years ago. They said the, the two main causes of disease are indigested food and then the toxin that forms and collects in the body from indigested food. And they have words for that. I am loving this interview. I'm appreciating your time. Do you have some more time to spend with us? I want to be very uh, respectful of your time. You're a busy guy. Yeah, let's uh, do a little bit more. And Great. I'm enjoying cool. myself. Um, we, we're talking about uh, all the different uh, benefits of, of this type of nutritional protocol. Um, at some point, a little bit in a little bit, I want to touch upon some of the dangers that are offered as an alternative, but I just want to do a little bit more of the solution. What in what do you eat in an average day? I'm a bad example because I don't, <laughs> my body's still out of balance. But uh, what, what I eat right now is I do uh, chicken soup with, with a lot of vegetables and uh, fermented dairy, and that's pretty much my diet. So chicken soup and fermented dairy and lots of veggies. And are you clean with that? You, you stick to it? Uh, as best I can. It's not enough calories. So I usually need, uh, I'll do um, potatoes, white rice, sourdough bread. Uh, What's with the starches? Are, is the starch just for simple? Do you ever run on ketosis or do you purposely bump yourself out of ketosis? So, so um my body does really well with carbohydrates. So there's people who are good carb digesters, there's good fat digesters and good protein digesters. I'm a good carb. Carbs work really well for me. So yeah, me I have too. no problem eating plenty of them. Me I too. always make sure to combine them with uh, some animal fat and some animal protein. Like if I just ate carbs plain, it would be terrible. Because you but raise your blood sugar? Go ahead. It, it, would it be terrible? I'm sorry, but this is, this is right. This is my edge. So I'm... Uh, this is really good information. When you eat your carbs with your protein, when you said if I eat, if I eat my carbs without my protein, it's horrible for me. Why is that? Um, it just causes that blood sugar fluctuation. Ah. My system gets irritated. Uh, I just feel funky. Um, yep. Always the 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 sugar load of the of the the easy digestible carbs is too much. And there's a lot of traditional cultures that consumed carbohydrates in large amounts, about 50% of calories or more. And they didn't have tooth decay. They didn't have gum disease. They didn't have um, heart problems. They don't have cancer. I don't think carbohydrates are bad at all. And we need them for our energy. We need carbs to, to fuel our body and to get enough. We don't have, not everyone has to have it. But if you crave them, you definitely need them. So I'll have like, um, let's say like a chicken soup with some with some white rice, and um, or a potatoes with eggs, or let's see what else. Um, I mean that's that's the main thing. Or the sourdough bread. I'll have I'll have uh, bread bread and cheese is amazing combination if you have good sourdough bread. Or is I'll the have sourdough bread. bread because you're it's a ferment because it's sour? It's firm. Yeah. I mean, the, the grains are, we have to be so careful with grains. They're so potentially toxic and all these cultures went through extreme lengths or most of them, the traditional societies went through extreme lengths to, to process their grains. And I think that's why people who try to get healthy, they end up just eliminating the grains because to have grains that you consume that doesn't irritate or inflame the body usually requires a lot of work. The simple grains is just the, the white rice and uh, um, white potatoes or sweet potatoes. Or, or those aren't grains, but that's the simple carbs that doesn't require a lot of work. Um, 
yeah, if the grain isn't really soured, then it's it's um, potentially going to cause inflammation. There's you know there's whole books about how how wheat and all that stuff's bad, but uh, it's it's acceptable when it's it's fermented and it's from fresh ground flour and, and it's sifted too. I don't recommend people eat the bran. That's a mistake and it's not necessary. Don't eat the bran and the whole grains. And uh, I've learned that from the work of uh, Edward Mallenby and also from experience. Uh, I'd have all these, I'd have parents contact me and say, my child's eating your perfect diet and fats and cauliflower oil and they still have cavities. And, the, the the missing link was the whole grains because whole grains have a lot of toxins in them and uh, the traditional societies for whatever reason decided to remove these toxins in general unless they had a bad year then they would eat the whole grain if they had a good year they will they will sift it that's one of the things that um, is another takeaway for us is that you're not saying you're against grains nuts seeds and beans it's more the preparation of these food types um, in that a lot of the people who are saying raw, 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 they might be right in certain cases, like when it comes to raw goat milk or, you know, certain types of raw as bone, when it comes to substances that have phytic acid and all of the enzyme inhibitors and the protection mechanisms that plants have, they don't want to die any more than we want to die. So they have their protection mechanisms and you're trying to digest that. And that might be impossible for us without some sort of preparation. Uh, well, it ends up pulling minerals out of our body, the minerals that we need for healthy teeth. And uh, even even properly pre prepared grains have, uh, in, if you look at traditional diets, they did food combining. So like in, in Asian cultures, they eat tons of rice, but they also eat tons of vegetables. And the vegetables, the vitamin C content of the vegetables helps balance any anti-nutritional result of eating the white rice. Uh, and then in the in the in the the wheat and rye cultures, like in the French Alps and Swiss Alps and stuff, they eat lots of cheese. So the cheese, the calcium, balances the anti-nutritional factors that are in the grains. Because also grains are just are very high in phosphorus. So is meat. So a lot of so if you have a lot of paleo people and they're eating lots of red meat and they're they're feeling good, uh, meat is very high in phosphorus. So you can. You can be, have a phosphorus and calcium imbalance. You have to have a lot of calcium in your diet to balance the phosphorus. And how you get calcium, there's different ways. Lots and lots of vegetables, lots of seafood, dairy products. And um, I'm coming out with a, a bone meal calcium for people who, who don't want to have dairy so they can get enough calcium. Give us that website again, um, especially the website where we could obtain some of these substances you're talking about. I'm I'm interested in the glandulars and some of these Tr other supplements. Where where we traditionalfoods.org coming July. Coming in July, boy, we're timely. In July. This is a timely podcast. This is uh, yeah. <laughs> this I haven't is... announced it to anyone even. Also, there's I'm going to have first milking colostrum, which is the ultimate first and second milking milking true colostrum, which is the ultimate. Uh, anti-aging healing and rebuilding food it's it's the most po powerful supplement that there is that i'm aware of on wow the planet. that's exciting and uh, where, exciting. where are you based out of well, i'm in vermont right now but the, the logistics is uh, the warehouse is in uh, washington and uh, with the colostrum that i have uh, it's imported from germany the other costumes from the U.S., they have to be pasteurized, and that destroys all the magic stuff. And also, they're not certified organic. This is a certified organic grass-fed colostrum. I actually have an organic certificate. It's not a misrepresented mis, uh, product. It's, it's really organic, and, it's, and it's, it's processed in a way that it's cold-filtered. It passes all the tests. It's legal to sell, but it's not been heated. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Folks, when you go into the stores and you see that not for human consumption, it's, you know, the, 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 the owner of the facility has to put that on there so they don't get in trouble. But go ahead and, and take that goat milk and ferment it. And trust me, there won't be anything in there nasty. If there was any questionable things in there, the fermentation is going to take care of that anyway. And it's going to take the lactose out of there so you won't have any digestion issues. And you'll get all those wonderful probiotics. you get the small proteins uh, that, you know, the absorption will be phenomenal. 
Um, well, we're we're closing in on one hour here, and I'm not even positive. This is a pretty funny thing to say, but I'm not even positive my software will go over it. It's a brand new recording software. I'm not sure it'll go over one hour. We're going to find out. If we go out hard, I just want to say that we're here with Rami El Nagel. He's telling us everything about uh, how to have dental health, and for that matter, the whole body health, because it is all connected and it's all related and we just rounded over one hour hey the software is still going yay <laughs> we're still recording uh let's touch upon one other quick thing and then i'll let you get out of here um you know for those who are, are still um you know questioning whether this is a protocol they want to take a look at um just remember again we're not saying to do anything or not to do anything Ramiel's not saying you know, he's some sort of uh, expert. He's standing on the shoulders of all of these uh, heavily credentialed experts, uh, very prestigious doctors and DDSs and PhDs, and he's just delivering information to you. Um, and it's for you to take, take what you like and leave the rest. Um, but most importantly, self-experiment, you know, see what works for you. Again, we're all different, different digestion, different metabolization and um, going back to the dental, uh, issues, um, I, when I was doing research for this show, pretty much every site that I pulled up, especially if they were allopathic, every one of them was really pushing fluoride in a, in a heavy way it was, it was, um, really pushing it. And, um, fluoride is not, there's some real, some dangerous, uh, aspects to fluoride. I'm looking through my notes here. Yeah, here it is right here. Um, the one that really uh, uh, stuck out is um, a couple of years ago, there was a clinical uh, study done by Harvard University, small little school in Boston. You probably haven't heard of it yet, but it's uh, Harvard University. They did a meta-analysis, um, which, which was funded by the National Institutes of Health. And that study concluded that children who live in areas with highly fluoridated water have significantly lower IQ scores, significantly lower IQ scores than those who live in low fluoride areas. That alone, if you take nothing else from this show, that alone should give you pause about whether you want to be putting fluoride in your children's mouth. What absorbs more quickly into the body than what you put in the mouth? Uh, really worth taking a look at what Ramiel's talking about just for that alone. Fluoride is not necessarily a good idea. Yeah, and they, what, what uh, other research has found is that if you want to prevent cavities in uh, children, all you have to do is make sure that the, pregnant, the mother before conception, during pregnancy, and during breastfeeding has enough calcium in her body. <laughs> But that that's sense, too right? easy. But that's too easy, Romeo. Give us something complicated and expensive, and and you know, I, I want something, what, you know, like that's that's it right there. And what what Weston Price showed us, and and other researchers probably of his time did too, is we're losing a lot of minerals in our soil, and now our soils are very depleted. So each generation gets worse and worse. They eat worse food, and also even in if they eat good food, it's got less minerals in it. If we wanted to solve our national health care crisis, we would, we would just remineralize all the soils around the country with uh, natural and organic additives, and the food would have more minerals. We'd all get healthier. We can get rid of fluoride. Uh, there's amazing, we would lower the health care costs, and we wouldn't have to worry about all this uh, um, madness in the healthcare world. The disease rates would plummet. So all we need to do is return to eating natural foods, uh, get more minerals. Now, here's the thing for your listeners: the number one mineral supplement. Uh, it's going. It's not even. It's going in my next book uh, when I update it, and that is kelp powder, organic kelp powder. You can buy from most health most health food stores. Also have a website where you can buy it easily, but it's it's available on most most health food stores. It has all these trace minerals. It will balance your body chemistry, and uh, when you combine it with some good fat soluble vitamins, you're going to get some excellent uh, results. And before we go one other quick time, because this is just, uh, I think it would be a great way to end the protocol that you're using to help people with their sugar cravings late at night. Cause that's, that's the biggest, that's the, 
you know, it's one thing to be clean during the day when you're working anyway and you kind of have a routine and a ritual. But when you come home and you're winding down and you're sitting down and watching an hour of television, that's when it hits for me. That's when it hits. What is the protocol to do a couple things? A, kill that sugar craving and B, not lose weight. I think I'm like you. I have I'm a hard gainer and it's an issue for me to keep my weight on. Um, so I don't necessarily want to not eat late at night, but what, what do you do to, to help with the sugar cravings? Don't really have sugar cravings anymore, but eating, eating, uh, so the sugar craving, when you get it, you're low on minerals, your body's deprived. So you got to eat plenty of food. That's the main thing. Right. Just the right. It doesn't food. even matter. Everything uh, that we've been talking about, all the food, the good oils, the good fats. Have some yogurt. You know, you like the goat milk. Have some yogurt because yogurt is a little different than kefir. Have some yogurt. That's a great snack. Yogurt with a little bit of nuts or trail mix. Um, even having some nuts. Just as soon as you're hungry, because th there's no expert. You're saying about experts. Each one of us is an expert in our own body. Nobody can tell us what's right or wrong or what we need. Some people can point us in the right direction. Uh but we each have our own experience of life. So uh, it's important to listen to your body. And when you have a need for food to, to give yourself that need. So if, if I say, you know, heart or liver, that's good for you. And people go, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's not because there isn't good science or bad science or whatever. It's because people don't listen to their body. If everyone was listening to their body, feeling how they feel, following their instincts with um, uh, mindfulness, uh, the world would be a different place. So you got to listen to your body and have food ready to go and always eat when you're hungry, even if you eat at night too. Or if you need to eat before bed, that's fine. That's actually good to eat before bed. And if you're, if you're feeling like you're hungry, but your appetite's not good, then you're having an enzyme issue, a pancreas issue. So... Um, the solution for that is to take uh, pancreas capsules. Um, Wolbenzyme is another brand, or just having a lot of vegetable juice between meals. That will increase your appetite. You want to increase your appetite and then have a normal snack or meal that has carbs, proteins, and fats in whatever ratio you feel is good. His name is Ramiel Nagel. He has come up with some incredible information um, to help you in your quest to get healthy. Give, give us your two websites again, Ramiel. CureToothDecay.com, TraditionalFoods.org. I also have HealingOurChildren.net, which is how to have healthy children before conception so you can get your body more into balance by following the pathways of our ancestors who knew how to eat and be healthy. Thank you uh, for joining us, Ramiel, very much. This is uh, great information. Thank you for having me. And thank you at home for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Gave you over an hour of jam-packed information on how to get well. We'll include information, those websites for Ramiel in our show notes. I'm Jay Adams. Thanks for joining us in our quest to go right at life, clear-headed and shredded. We'll see you next time. For our full schedule of fights on the NBC Sports Network, CW and ABC affiliates, visit unitedfightalliance.com. United Fight Alliance. United we fight. <laughs>